Women's World Banking is part of this sort of global community that has rallied around this concept of financial inclusion, which is a little bit of a um, sort of later stage word for, you know, some of the ideas that maybe uh, you may have heard about in the context of microfinance. But as technology and, and cell phone technology in particular really became an important part of the way that financial services can be delivered, uh, particularly in that last mile delivery um, in the developing world. Um, so many more players, so many more approaches, um, everything from you know, banks to cell phone companies to retailers, grocery stores, so many other players came into this space that somehow the concept of microfinance really no longer um, embraced all of what we're talking about when we're trying to bring low-income people and women in particular into the formal financial system. Um, so there's been just extraordinary explosive change in the last decade in terms of the number of people who, who do now have that access, but it unfortunately has been quite unfairly um, divided that, that, that progress. There is a very stubborn um, on average 9% gender gap between men and women having access to financial services in the developing world. But that average number, as you know, hides a, a multitude of sins. So you have you know, a gender gap closer to 30% in, in Bangladesh and even higher in, in Pakistan. So that 9% that really is, is only an average. And you have some countries where there are really enormous differences between women's and men's access um, to finance. And then sort of to compound that issue, one might say that even when we bring women into the system, they have bank accounts, those accounts are in their own name, we're not really designing products that speak to them, speak to their needs. And so we see a much greater rate of dormancy uh, in those accounts, up to 80% are inactive accounts. And the, the folks at the World Bank that uh, collect this data that we are, are very good friends with have, uh, frankly, a very low bar for activity. It's one usage in 12 months. So you can imagine if that 80% is, you know, folks who, uh, the 20% is people who've used it in, in 12 months, really, how how uh, reflective of low-income women's needs are the financial services that they're being offered with that level of dormancy. And so the, the heart of Women's World Banking's work really is not just the inclusion in, in sort of name only, but in making sure that the services that are offered, the products that are available are really useful to them and, and are, as I say, as I say uh, meeting, meeting their needs. Um, we find that you know, many people think of credit and microcredit as what may have drawn women into, um, in, into this whole concept of uh, financial inclusion, but really it tends to be savings. Um, women are typically the savers in the household and a safe place to save that is confidential so that maybe everybody in the village, everybody in the household, and maybe in particular her, uh, the woman's husband doesn't necessarily know that savings are being accumulated and is, is, is very highly prized. And so that's something that um, formal financial services, and as you can imagine, digital financial services are particularly well suited, uh, suited for. We find that the things that women really place a high premium on, um, you know, physical safety, walking around with a lot of cash, whether you're a man or a woman, is not a very safe position to be in. Secure in the sense that your money will be there when you, when you need it and, and that it is available to you conveniently. Um, and that there's a reliability that behind the, um, the provider of the service. So again, something that, that we feel the digital financial services are um, providing, uh, really meeting those needs and addressing those product attributes that low-income women in particular are, are looking for. Um, and then just to, to touch briefly on sort of the third the third leg of the, the stool, you know, I think 
people definitely understand the need for credit to, to grow an entrepreneurial business or to smooth consumption over the course of the month if you know the money isn't quite there at the end of the month to be able to borrow um, reliably is important. But so much of those other services are kind of put at risk if the family can't insure itself against, you know, really catastrophic risks. So illnesses of a breadwinner, or um, if, it, if we're talking about an agricultural um, situation, a, a drought or a flood. So the, um, so insurance is, an, is a very important part that that managing of risk is a very important part of the, the full bundle of services that we think of when we think of financial inclusion. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, so just a, a few um, a few numbers here that maybe just to really put the context of again something that we often think of as microfinance or you know the individual savings from very poor people themselves might be quite small but the macro impact of this is really quite quite astonishing and e even in this COVID environment um, the the impact that a greater equality of, uh, of ge greater gender equality across economic um, activities, but specifically in terms of having greater access to finance could add $13 trillion to global, global GDP by 2030. And you know, if you look at country after country looking at negative growth or you know, losses in, in GDP growth of you know, five, six years, it really is the moment for us to finally embrace that opportunity that gender equality, particularly in the realm of economic empowerment, um, leads us. We also sh see that so much of, you know, as I alluded to earlier, so many of the things that we think of as financial services, women are already doing. They're just doing them in perhaps a more expensive or less efficient um, or less effective way. So just a quick little statistic, we found amongst the institutions that Women's World Banking works with, that women were saving on average 10 to 15% of monthly earnings, which is you know just an insane savings rate, but they were primarily doing that to save against emergencies, particularly health emergencies. And so again, an appropriate tool. So in being able to insure against a health emergency rather than having to divert 10 to 15% of monthly income against that, that potential emergency really can change the dynamic in a family and its ability to manage risk and to build wealth. Um, the old truism that you've probably heard before that women are, are good borrowers is absolutely true at every uh, level of micro, small, medium enterprise, we find women having higher repayment rates. And that sometimes is almost like a double whammy, if you will, because we find that at the, the small business and, and uh, medium-sized enterprise business, they're often really penalized on loan terms, shorter periods of time to repay, shorter grace periods, higher interest rates, and yet still maintaining um, equivalent or better repayment rates than men. So they, they really can, uh, when they take on that, that responsibility, that obligation to pay, they, they really mean it. And so just to, to close out this slide, the, the sum total of this macro picture of, of a more inclusion for women at the financial level and a leveling of the playing field in terms of access to economic input really speaks to the way that women use money when they have uh, not only access to it but control over it is really quite dramatically different and there's a, a growing number of, of studies now showing that you know children in a family that where the mother has a say a 10 percent increase in her income both boys and girls have have better survival rates, and both boys and girls have achieve higher levels of education versus a household where the man, for example, would have a 10% increase in income. The girls' lives actually are made appreciably worse, lower survival rates, no improvement in education, and frankly, the boys don't do any better. So you see them kind of staying at a steady state, not getting worse, but you don't see that kind of investment and improvement 
um, in their education levels and in their survival. So women are are stewards of of finance in a very different way um, than than men are. That is uh, has a sort of intergenerational multiplier in effect that is is uh, part of that. Um, that virtuous circle that can drive greater global change. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, just this, these next couple of slides are a little bit of an introduction to Women's World Banking. We turned 40 years old last year. Um, and so we've really, since our very, very earliest roots have been dedicated to providing access to finance to low-income women in, in emerging markets. Um, next slide. And the way we do that really is sort of three distinct pillars. Um, we work directly with financial service providers and, and uh, policymakers on what are the ways to engage women clients. As I mentioned before, that very high rate of dormancy. What, what's that about? And how can we tease out what's keeping women from engaging more? What would a product, service, regulation need to look like if it were to have that, that deeper activation and engagement with women? Um, a second pillar of our of our strategy, which um, is a very exciting one, uh, that is probably the the newest part of our business, is um, we have a gender lens. We have actually now two gender lens investment funds. We had a fifty million dollar fund that is fully invested. Uh, that we are now in the, the, the exit stage. We've had a, a couple of exits. One, which we're very proud of, was an IPO on the Mumbai Stock Exchange, which we did very well financially. So uh, doing well and doing good is, is indeed uh, doing it possible. And we just, probably the highlight of my lockdown experience was a $75 million first closing on our second fund, which we've also just started to invest. We have our first investment we made at the beginning of September in, in a fast fascinating um, Indian low-income housing uh, finance company that focus ex focuses exclusively on women and which is all about getting women's names on the title to the houses that they're financing. And so we see that there's a lot of research and a lot of linkages when women are asset owners, how that can lead to their, their greater empowerment. And then the last, but by no means least, um, pillar of our strategy is we have a, a several different uh, leadership and diversity training programs. One that's directed specifically at financial service providers where we have a, we pair a senior executive that can be a man or a woman and a high potential woman and they go through nine months of training together. We partner with the Wharton School of Business on that program and then we have a very similarly structured program for regulators. Um, diversity is a disaster in central banks and insurance regulators around the world. And so we're really trying to build that diversity of perspectives because a lot of people think policy is gender blind and, and really nothing could be further from the truth, but you may not be able to see that if you don't have that diversity around the table. So that's a partnership um, with Oxford University that we offer to um, teams of senior regulators and the high potential women, women regulators. Um, next slide. And then I think I've said actually most of, most of the things here that we're really trying to drive impact with various audiences, certainly the po policymakers and the financial service providers themselves, but also in the work that we, we do, we are, um, other than the investment fund, we are a nonprofit organization influencing the donors that we work with, as well as the investors that now are, are investing alongside us in the fund. Next slide. So it doesn't really, it didn't seem right not to talk a bit about the impact of COVID on our work, on the women that we're working to serve. I think there've been a lot of, um, in, the, in the last couple of weeks, there've been some really pretty shocking stories about how the, uh, the ec epidemic has affected women in their workplace, women leaving the workforce um, in much higher numbers than men, and then unemployment in this, this crisis has been much, much more severe for women um, th than for men. What we're seeing with our, um, with our organizations that we're working with is, is 
all of those impacts that women are have always done a greater share of the unpaid care work in a in a household and that is burden is falling even more heavily um, on them but we're also seeing that where women have access to cell phone technology and the consequent uh, digital financial services they're they're actually able to kind of come out of um, the immediate crisis much faster. And so a lot of our uh, focus has been on uh, the, the government to person payments that nearly every country in the world now has, has offered in response to the economic crisis. You've had two countries, India and Peru, that made their, their crisis response payments only accessible to women. Uh, and so you've seen some really interesting responses when you know, the woman is the, the, the carrier of that recovery and of that resilience. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the work that we're specifically doing with governments, but there's a, a little video that one of our, our team in India um, took just at the period of time when India was first releasing these payments and women were discovering that they were the sole recipients of these payments. And so, um, Lily, can you maybe just put that video on and I'll, um, I'll maybe talk over it, but it's, it's just uh, was such a stunning picture of uh, the, the need for um, women's awareness of the, of the financial services and how the COVID crisis has really brought, um, can, brought can women you, into the financial sector. Sorry to interrupt, can you see my, can you see the video? I, I can see it, it's okay. not moving. It's just that okay. Opening, okay. Hold on, let me... opening slide. Yeah. Oh, great. So this is a this is a video that was taken just on a on a cell phone um, outside of a, a bank that we're working with, one of the, the largest banks in India, when women realized that these payments were sitting in their accounts, we saw very slow take up over the, the course of the, uh, you know, in the, in the first couple of weeks after the payments were made, women weren't aware of them. We, women weren't aware that the payments had been distributed. They weren't aware of how to actually access them through their cell phones. Um, if they even had cell phones, women, the, the cell phone gap, the technology gap is the highest in South Asia in, in the world. So a lot of the issues that had been sort of simmering under the, the surface and really standing in the way of women's broader financial inclusion have really come to the, the forefront um, with the crisis. Um, I remain an eternal optimist, however, and so I'm very excited that literally millions of bank accounts have been opened uh, in these last uh, few months in order to facilitate um, recipients, uh, digital recipients of these, of these payments. I wonder if I could have the slide back. That's great, that's great. Um, so we've been working very closely both with ministries, um, the Ministry of in Indonesia, uh, Social Affairs in Indonesia, for example, um, has really been uh, very responsive to some of the recommendations we made about how we could make sure not only that the payments were getting to women, that they were using them, but that we then didn't lose this group of people who had just been brought into the formal financial system. How can we make sure that this, that this crisis doesn't go to waste, if you, if you will? Um, and so a lot of our work has been focused not only on closing that digital gap, but also the capability gap. Uh, one of the recommendations, for example, that we made to the Indonesian ministry was that they've made a number of very important and, and helpful changes to the program, but they hadn't really trained the agents that, that um, dealt with the low-income women in delivering these payments on how those changes really might affect the women. And so they've immediately you know, ramped up their financial literacy training for the agents. So sort of a training of trainers um, had a, a, a much um, quicker ramp up and you've seen, already seen the take up by women really being affected that way. Um, next slide. Um, so I, I think one thing that I, I, I think is so important and, and that I think of as a real distinguishing feature of women's world banking is that when, when we 
talk about bringing women into the, the formal financial system, we always add to the end of that sentence, you know, for what end, to what purpose? Having a bank account in and of itself really isn't, you know, isn't worth very much, if you will. And so we took a number of years to develop, but we, we worked off of a, an empowerment framework that had been kind of bouncing around in the microfinance community, but really tailored it to the experience of women that we were seeing when they interacted with financial service providers. We, um, so it looks specifically at what are the changes that a woman experiences as she engages with a financial service um, for example, you know, material change. That one's an easy one to, to measure. Was there an income in, uh, increase in income? Has the household had, an, had an increase in assets? Uh, cognitive change might next be the next one you'd see. Did she learn a new skill? Does she have a higher level of digital capability as a result of engaging with a digital financial service? But then the next two levels of change I, I think are really the exciting ones. Um, one is, is relational. Did, does she have a greater degree of, um, uh, of personal uh, decision-making power? Does she have more bargaining power in decisions that are made in the household? Is she more likely to vote? We see a very interesting correlation between women's access to finance and their decision to vote and to stand for, um, for public office. And then perhaps the hardest to measure, but really what we're aiming for at the highest level is what we refer to as perceptual change. Does the, does the woman have a greater sense of self-esteem? Is she planning for the future? Is she able to, to dream and think beyond the day-to-day -day need? And so this framework really sits as the main way that we monitor our, our progress um, and that uh, in, in, we usually do a sort of a baseline study, depending on the length of the project we're working on, we may do a midline, but then also measuring um, outcomes at, at the end against um, these kinds of changes in, in women's lives. Um, next slide. So I, one of the things I really loved about the, the Cloudera Day of Service was that it, you're, you're taking this really seriously about moving from just the presentations to what are the actions that, that one could take personally. And so we had a lot of fun actually thinking about ways that I might uh, call you to action. And certainly there's always a good start to, to educate yourself, to learn more. I was personally very touched by um, Melinda Gates's uh, memoir, which came out earlier this year, The Moment of Lift. Um, I do think there, none of us can be, um, can do enough to be educated consumers of financial services. Really do a little digging, look at whether the organizations that you bank with or your insurance company or your brokerage firm, do they have women in senior leadership positions on, and, and do they support a variety of sort of women friendly um, uh, policies? Because that's really going to be a very big driver. The number of women, the diversity of women uh, of, 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 their, of their, their staff and governance is really going to drive so much of the way they serve um, their clients. Um, certainly, I, I think being a mentor to uh, you know, other women, particularly underrepresented groups of women um, in your community, uh, so many of the issues that I've talked about today are every bit is evident amongst women uh, in the United States, but I know we're talking to a global audience here. So you don't have to, usually have to scratch very, very deep to find um, women who could really use some support in terms of a greater financial literacy, understanding of what their financial options are. Um, something that I've become personally very passionate about is um, when, I, when I began to see the the linkages between um, gender-based violence and, and domestic violence in the home and financial abuse and how linked those were. And almost every woman that reports having been uh, physically abused by a partner, it turns out he or she has been keeping her away from and gradually reducing her ability um, to maintain any agency around um, financial resources. And so if you do find that to be a cause worth supporting, 
you know, maybe do a double click and find out whether they, they have programs that provide financial literacy, budgeting, keeping your money secret, keeping your money separate um, programs that they offer. And then I would be remiss if I didn't um, say that one of the things you could certainly do is find the donate button on our website. But um, we would just love to have you as a, as a supporter. And uh, as I say, you've got lots of options, but we'd love it if you'd consider that as one of them. Thank you.